going to be talking about um, API client libraries and basically how to make how to write one of these that your client developers are not going to be banging their head against the keyboard while they're trying to write their client. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start off with um, with just the structure of the talk. Have some you know introductions with like where I'm coming from, where you all are coming from. Um, just some uh, cool things that you can make using web APIs if if you needed convincing. Reasons to use an API client library even in the best of all possible worlds, which is unfortunately not the world that we live in. And then I'll get to the meat of the talk, which is what are the features of a usable API client library. And finally, I'll detour into um, talking a little bit more generally about design principles that we can use to think about developer experience and, and sort of our part, our part in this ecosystem of making tools for, that we all can use. All right, so a little bit about this, a little bit about this talk. Um, I'm, it's, it's aimed at sort of two, two sets of people. There's uh, folks who either write or maintain one of these libraries, and there's also folks who want to use them for their own projects. The biggest thing um, for the second group that I want to get out is it is almost certainly not just you who's having any problems that you've run into. Um, so a couple, of, um, a couple of questions for you all. So raise your hand if you know what an API is. Great, you're in the right place. Um, <laughs> same, same sort of uh, grounding thing. If you know what, um, what a, an API client library that you might be using is. All right, so um, yeah, how many of you have, have written your projects against someone else's API? Cool. Um, how many of you have used a client library to do that? Okay, so about half. And how many of you have written one or maintained one that, okay, so a handful. So a little bit about myself. I, this talk is based on some work that I did during my internship for the Wikimedia Foundation last summer. When I started, we had a page, a page listing um, client libraries that have existed at some point, um, sorted by language at least, but without much information about say what they're good for or what, um, whether they're even maintained, whether how usable they would be, any of that. So where I came in was I looked at, looked at what there was, wrote a standard for what MediaWiki developers would really like to see from these, um, from these libraries. And I should say that, they, that these are third party volunteer written. So when I'm talking about these, I am in in no way um, trying to denigrate anyone's hard work, but as always, people don't always um, people don't always have the same priorities, and um, and yeah. So in general, I care about making it possible for other people to make usable and effective tools to do good work. Some basic assumptions for this talk. I'm. I'm mostly talking, I'm mostly thinking of third party libraries, but the principles are going to be the same, no, whether you're writing one for your own company or, or someone else's. If there's a question, I'm talking about RESTful APIs, but again, these are, um, these are pretty, these are pretty, um, these aren't so specific. And with any best practices talk, I want to acknowledge that we all do have different priorities. 
And it's entirely valid for usability to not be something that you care to or can prioritize at a time. So if you, if you have one of these and you're like, oh no, she's going to judge me for not, um, not sticking to all of these, then, well, it may be harder for someone to pick up your library, but that may not be your priority and that is perfectly valid. These, many of these are related to programming best practices that we have heard over and over again in various contexts, but they, they apply to APIs in, in their own ways. All right. Okay, so kind of, kind of briefly, I'm, as I don't think that you all need very much convincing, but there are some pretty cool um, applications of, of um, of APIs that I've found apps. Everyone loves apps. Um, you need to get data, data out of the database over the internet. You're probably going to be using the API somewhere in there. Research. This is one that, that, we, um, that we care about for, for Wikimedia specifically because we have a ton of data that has been contributed to our projects over the years. And there are both internal and independent researchers who want to track things like um, trends in editorship, trends in who's editing, trends in what sorts of um, interventions are, are useful. So you can, use, you can use an API to um, get data, particularly data that's more volatile, um, that's not, you know, may, maybe, the, maybe the site's going to offer a dump or something of data or something like that, but, um, but for stuff that changes or for something like Twitter, if you're doing research on Twitter, you're probably going to be getting, getting at least some of that through their API. There are some really cool examples of data visualization and data art. There's, in the wiki realm, there's one project called Backstory that, that visualizes the history of articles related to HIV and AIDS over the past 13 years. So it's a graphical um, presentation of that revision history that you can click on and sort of see the diffs, um, but over a much larger time span. Mobile development, um, again, super, as Stephanie mentioned this morning, super important for, um, for folks who are only on mobile phones. And some, some things that I find really fascinating are the ways that people use, AP, use provided APIs to extend site functionality. So for instance, there's the various blocking applications for Twitter, um, Good Game, now Good Game Auto Blocker, um, Block Together, Flamingo, Blockbot. All of those go through the Twitter API to provide, um, provide functionality that Twitter did not um, choose to offer as a part of their main website in order to make it useful um, for situations like um, sustained harassment campaigns. Another really interesting example is Xkit. Tumblr is not very good at um, providing, providing spaces and mechanisms for conversation. It's much more of a fork things, bring them into your own space, um, and publish things that you like. Xkit is an extent is sort of the um, social interactions find a way <laughs> of of that particular site, and that goes through the API. So you can do some pretty cool stuff. Why use a client library? Why not just um, you have this perfectly good? Well, you hope you have this perfectly good API that, um, and maybe you have your HTTP library, and maybe you could just use that. Well, I'm going to start from. I'm going to start from the best of all possible worlds here. Cases why you might want to why you might want to use one no matter what. And sort of sadly and slowly move into the world that we live in. So even even if the API itself is fine, maybe you just don't want to keep on handling HTTP and auth and um, parsing the API um, response over and over and over. Maybe you want to be working at a different level of abstraction. So maybe you want to, maybe you are writing wiki bots 
and you don't, you don't care about the revision history. You don't care about, you don't care that there's this, there's this model of you have the site and you have the page and you have the revision, the latest revision of the page and you have the text associated with the latest revision. Maybe you don't care about that. Maybe you just want to have a get me the text of the page because that's the level of granularity that you care about. Maybe you want to um, put the response into your own language's idiom. Maybe the API for good, for good and historical reasons is, um, is giving you back XML and you're writing Python and you really just want to stick it into a dictionary and have done with it. Your library can do that for you so that you're not having to parse every single time. Starting to move away from things that are really not the API's fault. Perhaps the API wasn't designed for your goals. People who want to do research on Facebook run into this. The Facebook API is designed for people to be able to write apps that individual people can use. Facebook, as, um, as Karina mentioned, wants to be able to run experiments on, um, wants to be able to run experiments and do research on its own, of course, but it's really not so keen about external researchers or, com or competitive companies being able to get any of that data for their own purposes. Um, try reading the rate limiting rules sometime if you really want to be confused. And getting more into this, this sad world. Maybe the API wasn't designed well. API design is a skill. Um, it's, maybe it was designed on a deadline. Maybe, maybe the company was like, okay, I guess we need one of these. And well, you're writing it. May, and maybe it's, okay, we really need to have this by our launch next week. Can you put something together? So there, there are a lot of reasons why an API might not have been, you know, carefully separating layers of abstraction and, you know, spell checking all of the names to make sure that they actually, well, that one's um, less usual, but it does happen. <laughs> it's also possible that the API wasn't designed so much as grew. Maybe, um, maybe people were like, all right, we have this database. We can just have people, we can just have some sort of like way for people to essentially just run queries against the database without, um, because the, the scheme is good enough for us, we're used to it. It'll certainly be good enough for anyone who lacks the context and um, is, is not intimately familiar with their business logic. Maybe. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe this happened and then maybe people were like, okay, we need something to work better. So you end up with, um, in, in some cases, perhaps three methods to, three slightly different methods to get some amount of text from the current revision of a page. Um, it's also possible that the API was designed, that someone did put care and thought into this couple of times. So we have the, um, we have the flow chart for Google deprecation notices. And um, so this is, this is another thing where <laughs> if the, um, if the client, if the client library author is keeping up to date with all of the, um, with all of the various deprecations and new features and everything, that is work that you don't have to do as an individual developer. So, um, so quickly going over what you can get from a good client library. You don't have to keep implementing the boring bits. I am sick of various HTTP stuff and, um, and seeing whether it's, that, like there are some that don't support HTTPS. You can write in your own idiom you can add abstraction at the layers that you want it. And more generally, you can design around the pain points. So the API can be like that nice shiny path that someone very carefully put together for you to use. But it, it's not as 
you know, it's not as fast as you want to get there. It doesn't go precisely where you want. So an API client library can be like a desire path that takes you closer to the place that you actually want to be for the code that you want to write. All right. So let's talk about what makes a good, and here by good I mean usable client library. Let's start thinking about a developer's story. So, so she has this idea for an app or something like that. And first, one, first looks around and is lucky enough to find a handful of libraries. First, th first thing she wants to find is, OK, does this do what I want? You know, I need these features. Does it, have, does it have them? Is this compatible with the sorts of things that I want to do? Once, once she finds a likely candidate, she wants to um, have it easy to just spin it up and start, start using it to make, make a couple of test requests and see, you know, does, does it work? Can I install it? If yes, then, then she's going to want to be able to actually find the appropriate ways to use the library as she's writing her code. Because she's human and is writing code, code has bugs, she'll want to be able to track to localize those to either problems with the API, problems with the library, or problems in her own code. And because this developer is a model open source citizen, she wants to give back to the library and maybe submit some issues or, um, or put, push some bug fixes back upstream. So let's start off with easy to understand. What makes a client library easy to understand? The number one thing is findable and accurate documentation. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot, of, a lot of heads nodding. But this is, this is the sort of thing that, um, for instance, you migrate from SourceForge to GitHub. But your documentation is still, is still associated with the old SourceForge code that hasn't been updated in a couple of years. And that hasn't been moved over. And there's no link in the readme. Maybe all of your documentation is on the GitHub wiki in that really obvious small gray button along the side in the middle of a bunch of other small gray buttons that doesn't look like it ought to have a thing. Um, if you, if you have docs, which I hope you do, put a link in the readme if it is not the readme itself. Questions that your docs want to answer. What does it do? What is it aimed at? Is this, um, taking, the, taking the example of MediaWiki, like, is this intended for really hardcore um, writing, writing robust wiki bots for repeated and continuous wiki maintenance? Is it something that's more research focused? Is it something that really just wants to handle query continuations and so you don't have to write that bit of boilerplate yourself? What isn't it good for? Um, if, if you have something that's really heavyweight, then maybe you don't want to, um, maybe you don't want to recommend, maybe you don't want to recommend its use for you know, you just want to run a couple of queries and get a smallish data set. Which versions of the API does it handle? It, it sucks to start, out to, um, to start working and find out that the version that, you're, that you think you're going to be working with isn't actually handled by this thing that you've just spent some time setting up and getting, getting started with. And it should have code samples. And those code samples should be documented, should be commented, and should be functional. Because developers, I can tell you, are lazy. If you provide code, that code is going into someone's app. <laughs> so um, so make, make sure it works. 
All right, so so this looks like a pretty good a pretty good um, API client library to use. Let's get started with it. So, in the infinite variety of human experience, I am sure that there is at least one person on this beautiful, large, diverse planet who has or will uttered these words. I have not met them. I do not expect to ever meet them. Um, if this is you, then let me know and I will um, <laughs> admire. Make it easy. Take advantage of the ecosystem. Remember least surprise. Unless you absolutely need to, don't do weird stuff here. If you're doing in Python, make it package it so that you can just do pip install my library and have that work. There's, there's one client library that I, that I tried to get started with that was, um, had, had its own like, in, installation and setup script. I tried to use it in a Python virtual environment and that would not work unless I had that setup file in my home directory. There are probably, there are, as with anything legacy, there are historical reasons for this, I am sure. I don't know what they are, but it certainly surprised me, and I know that it surprised other people. So like that, work with common development practices, not against them. And if you are doing something surprising, document that. Also on the documentation notes, Including a getting started section in your docs is super useful. And this, like so much of what I'm talking about here, is a situation where 20% of the effort will get you 80% of the way. Doing, doing it yourself, you know, you know basically how to, and just copying your terminal history, just having that is so much better than not having anything at all, especially for newer pro programmers or programmers who are newer to the ecosystem that you're working in. All right, so, so we've, we've installed it. It's working, cool. How to, how to write something t that people will want to use, or at least people won't hate themselves too much while they're using. Include, include the basic stuff that you would hope uh, a library covers. Um, handle HTTP, handle HTTPS, not um, one, of the, one of the common um, Python HTTP libraries does not in fact handle HTTPS and some of the, some of the Python um, client libraries similarly didn't, were depending on this and so they couldn't handle that. Handle authen authentication with whatever system um, with whatever, with whatever system your site uses. And offer appropriate helper functions, that, that whole helping people get it into their own idiom. Follow principles of good API design. When you're writing a client library, you're taking an API and you're sticking an API on top of it. So you are, um, just like you, you hope that the API that you're working with is something that's easy to understand, you want to make something yourself that is also going to be easy to understand. So what does that mean? First thing, use self-explanatory and unambiguous names. One, one story here. Um, one of the client libraries that I was looking at had a method called page.edit. What do you think that did? You would be wrong. It fetched the page text. Um, that, that method has since been renamed to, so the, the workflow was previously page.edit, page.save. I assume that the, that the thought there was just like you would click the edit this page button on Wikipedia, and that would throw you into a thing that you could edit and change. Um, however, in the isolated client context, that's really not what you expect. Um, it has since been renamed to page.txt, so now it's page.txt, page.save, and this is much more suggestive of actually getting the text of a page. Also, um, spell, them, spell them correctly. Even if you're, even if you're doing something um, 
that you can't actually name a magic word or something like that. Expecting people to remember your idiosyncratic um, deliberate misspelling of that is still just sort of like, OK, I have to look that up again. So once, once you've named these things, you want to sort out the things that are named. So work at separate layers of abstraction. For instance, the library that I was picking on a little bit before, um, it's actually one of my favorite ones for MediaWiki, MW Client. Um, it, it separates out, it separates out um, everything into, you have the stuff that's with the basic site, and if you want to write your own, just write your own API calls and have it handle that. But if you want to um, work at the level of, I would just like to work with a page not with a set of revisions. Um, there's that. And then if you want to work with images, that has its own um, stuff. So again, this is, this is the sort of thing that they tell you over and over again. And I, I know that I'm telling you over and over, but it is one of the keys to making an, a usable API. And keep security in mind. Again, programmers are lazy, and security is hard. And so like, so like um, with the HTTPS example, if you, don't, if you don't put that in there, if you don't mention it, then your users aren't going to either. Um, they may not mind um, making all of their edits in plain text. Some of them will and just won't know that's what they're doing. Um, making sure that you get the auth whatever authentication method right also very relevant here. Similarly, you want to set good and courteous defaults. Whatever defaults you set in your library, people are going to use those. If those defaults lead to um, the, the, site, so the site maintainers with, of the site that has the API getting very cranky at you, or very cranky at the people who are using your library, that's, I mean, it, it's, you, you can say, well, people should know, but the reality is, people are going to assume that you know what you're doing. So that can be stuff like um, handling rate limiting yourself. That can be stuff like setting an appropriate user agent or making it easy for easier possible for your users to set their own user agent. OK. So there's some code. We want to, um, it's not working. What do we do? This is a kind of tricky one, because we are working against an API here. This, again, is one of those things where the 80 per, the 20 percent of effort will get you a ways. If you don't feel up to testing, um, you know, doing the stuff with mocks and stubs and keeping your tests super up to date when the API changes, if you don't feel up to that, like the, this is just a little project you're working on, you don't want to deal with that, test the stuff that doesn't touch the API. Write tests for all of your helper methods, and that will at least help people localize where the problem is likely to be. Another thing, we all, we all run into corner cases. We all do little hacky stuff. We all have that one thing that, you know, if I just add this condition in, it'll work and that issue will be resolved. This is part of life. But there are better and worse ways to handle it. So for this, um, this is one of the best commented hacks that I have seen. So if file is not none, and then the comment starts, work around for this GitHub issue, an explanation, and since the file name is not interpreted, we can send a dummy name instead of the real file name, which can contain um, non-Latin characters. And it has, the, um, it has the code, and it marks the end of the kludgy hack. So if someone is going in and cleaning this up, they don't have to wonder, like, is it this whole thing? Is it just this bit of the condition? This is entirely unambiguous, and I wish that more people um, and took and took the time to um, took the time to mark the corner cases to mark the stuff that might go a little bit weird. All 
all right, so last up. This is this is sort of more of a more of a less less code, more more culture at this point. License it. If you want someone to be able to legally contribute and share and use, use an appropriate license. Um, it's Again, seems seems obvious, but some people just don't don't think to set accurate expectations. So, if this is a project that you're working on, it's just a side project. You wrote it like three years ago. People are using it, and you you like that, but you have other things that you're working on right now, and you are really not up to dealing with pull requests. That's fine. That's totally fine. But put that in your, in your doc somewhere so that people don't say, hey, this is really cool. I'd like to improve it. I'd like to contribute to it. And then they submit a pull request, and it just sits there. That's, um, that's not respectful of other people's time. And by setting those expectations, you'll be helping them be more respectful of your time. And finally, Especially if you're lucky enough for your project to have to have built a community around it, make sure it's a welcoming community. Uh, set have a code of conduct. Make you know keep keep an eye on the conversation that's going on in um, in pull request discussions and just say, hey, you know you can disagree on whether this is a good idea, but let's not assume that. That their that their background is terrible, that they're terrible, that they don't know what they're doing. Everyone is wrong sometimes. All right, so that that is the um, that's that's the sort of meat of the about client libraries specifically. I want to step back and talk a bit about this idea of developer experience and how you can think about it. So. When you're, when you're making something that you are hoping that people use, you are a designer, whether you think of yourself that way or not. So design principles are useful. I guarantee you that if you walk through these doors every single day, if you tell yourself you ought to know better by now, you are still going to push those doors because the because the bars look like push bars and you have to wait and catch up, wait for your brain to catch up and say, oh, that says pull, I guess I should pull it. Same with this. You're going to pull those. You are not going to think to push those the first thing. This concept is called um, the concept of an affordance. It's the, it's the thing where um, it's a culturally... Um, specific but but broad expectation that that you know this this is a screw top i unscrew it and now this is an open container which i can fill with other things this is a phone it has a button buttons are for pushing this is a code sample code samples i expect to be able to get them to run you are you are um, providing an an experience as a writer and you are being provided with a certain set of cues as a library user. So that means that if you keep on doing the wrong thing with it, if you keep on like doing the equivalent of running into that door over and over and over again, one thing I really want you all to take out of this is that it's probably not your fault. You are probably queuing off, um, queuing off things that have been um, provided to you and you know you'll need to work around them if you if you want to keep on working with this but instead of thinking oh i'm I, i'm so stupid how could i um how could i still not know how this works cut yourself a little bit of slack there so a, a software is a tool a client an api client library is a tool and in general, tools should make it possible to work more effectively. They should use sensible affordances to guide users. Um, just, just like when I asked you all about the edit method, you, you all expected it to edit. That's an affordance. 
And the biggest thing is that they should be designed with respect and empathy for the user. And if, if the creator, if the designer is coming from that point of view, you'll get a lot of that 80% of the way there. So some, some resources that I've found useful in thinking about all of these things. The developer experience blog is not being updated anymore, but it has some fantastic links for thinking about how to write software for humans to use. The, um, there's a link to the gold standard that I wrote um, that, that we'd like as me, uh, the MediaWiki libraries to sort of aspire to. Again, these are, these are mostly third-party volunteers, so it's very much an aspirational standard, not something that we're coming down and enforcing. Since, since you're putting an API on top of an API, um, Jasmine Blanchett's Little Manual of API Design is an excellent paper for some of those basic API principles. Harm reduction for developers is not about um, is not about specifics, but it's about a mindset where, you know, we're not going to write all of the tests for all of the methods when time, when, when time comes down. But there may be ways that we can ameliorate the results of, um, of sort of what we are working with. And finally, why developers hate your API if you have been frustrated working with one, read that and be like, yes, that is terrible. That is the terrible that I encountered. So um, I would like to first thank everyone I was working with um, in, in this project last year, particularly Sumana Hari Harishwara, who, is, um, who already spoke um, yesterday. And she, she was my, one of my mentors for this. Tala Fagin was the other. And, um, and yes, so I would also like to thank you all for um, your time and attention. And if we have time, then I will take questions. <laughs>